Good evening. I'm calling this meeting to order. The time is 535 in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. This meeting is officially open with a quorum present. This evening, students from Hazel Harvey Peace Elementary School will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. In just a moment, Principal Anthony Avery will introduce them. But first, let's stand for the pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. President Jackson, members of the school board, Dr. Scribner, uh, it's an honor to be here this evening. Let me uh, introduce two of our amazing students. Uh, we have Aaliyah Coleman and we have Michael Watkins. Uh, we also have one of our staff members here, Mrs. Coleman as well. And we just wanted to say thank you for this honor to present to you tonight. Thank you. Aaliyah and Michael, most excellent job. Let's give them one more round of applause. And now Clint Bond from our communications department will begin the recognitions. Thank you, President Jackson. Members of the board, Dr. Scribner, our greeters this evening are from the Army JROTC unit at Carter Riverside High School, where Greg Ruthart is the principal. Students, as I call your name, please stand. Helping us this evening were Cadet Sergeants Jacoby Lewis, he's a senior, Corporal Brenda Sante is a freshman, PFC Carla Chavez is a freshman, and PFC Gabriel Garza is a freshman. So let's give them a round of applause. Major Eric Weeks is the senior Army instructor. He's not here this evening, but he's represented by Sergeant First Class Antonio Castro. So thank you all. Our parent recognition for this evening is from the Meadowbrook Middle School STEM Preparatory Academy. Would, we would like to recognize Mrs. Nicole Fox, Mrs. Maria Lucio, and Mr. Paul Calhoun. So would you please stand? Mrs. Fox, go ahead. Yep. All three have provided immeasurable support and are on track to surpass 100 volunteer hours to the school since the beginning of the school year. On any given day, you can find Mrs. Fox chaperoning field trips, supporting teachers in the classroom, serving on the STEM parent committee, assisting with a host of family engagement programs and activities. Mrs. Lucio and Mr. Calhoun are not only proud parents of a Meadowbrook STEM Academy student, but Mr. Calhoun is the owner of Smokey's Barbecue on Lancaster. On several occasions, they have donated lunch for staff appreciations and STEM Academy banquets. They have held fundraisers at Smokey's to support campus initiatives, provided much needed supplies for the boat regatta competition, and have donated gym equipment. When asked to sum up what these outstanding volunteers mean to the staff and students, Principal McWilliams had this to say, their time and talent goes far beyond hours at the school. They fill in a gap when faculty and staff are doing their jobs. So it is an honor to present Mrs. Nicole Fox, Mrs. Maria Lucio, and Mr. Paul Calhoun with a certificate of appreciation for family engagement. We have one final recognition for this evening, and it's a community recognition for Jim and Gloria Austin. Would you please stand? When, <laughs> when Jim Austin and Gloria Reed met in Fort Worth during the early 1990s, they discovered they had a lot in common. 
Not only were they both interested in assisting the development of their city by working in the real estate business, but they were also deeply committed to promoting a strong, diverse, and compassionate community. Together, they participated in the formation of the Renaissance Cultural Center, which offered educational and cultural programs, scholarships, and other services to support the young, the old, and the poor within Fort Worth's inner city. And they are also committed partners to the Fort Worth ISD. And Board President Toby Jackson wants to share a few words of appreciation to these community leaders. Welcome, Jim and Gloria. Thank you for your dedication to our community. I don't know that I've ever called that you first didn't answer and second didn't say, yes, I'll take care of that for you. You've invested time and love in your efforts to help our students, especially our seventh graders at William James. And we have our principal here, Joycelyn Barnett. Would you stand up? Let us give you a hand. <laughs> Texas history is a lot more fun if you can do that with Jim and Gloria at their museum. Thank you for your help and helping our students understand black, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian cowboys for real with tactile things, with visual things, and also being able to hear. Uh, your help has changed their lives, and they'll forever remember you. I also want to thank you and commend you for reminding them of the Tuskegee Airmen, of which we had two recently pass in this city, and also remembrance of the Buffalo Soldiers. Thank you all for who you are every day for our kids. Thank you. This concludes our scheduled recognitions. We will take a very, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't see your light on, Ms. Moss. Why does this always happen? I don't know, but President Jackson, Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Gloria and Jim Austin, stand back up. <laughs> I will not repeat all the great things that uh, President Jackson stated, but I just wanted to commend you for all of the free tickets you've given to Fort Worth ISD students for the rodeo, Cowboys of Color, every year. So again, thank you because our students really enjoy the rodeo. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Moss, and I'll add to that. Loretta Burns always says she thinks at some point a parent will say thank you for the help with reading, but instead it's thank you for those rodeo tickets. <laughs> this concludes our scheduled recognitions. We'll take a short recess so our guests may depart if they choose. Moving on to reports and presentations, the first thing we have is a notice of compliance with board member training requirements. In accordance with board policy BBD legal, the board president shall announce each member's continuing education hours annually at the last regular meeting before an election of trustees. Completing the required continuing education is a basic obligation and expectation of any board member under state board of education rule. All board members are required to complete continuing education requirements for the 2018-19 calendar year. I will now state the number of continuing education hours each board member has completed this year. Toby Jackson, 8.75. Ann Sutherland, 2.50. T.A. Sims, 8.75. Norman Robbins, 26.95. Jacinto Ramos, 19. Ashley Paz, 17. Judy Needham, 5. Trustee Anayo Luebanos, 20.5. Christine Moss, 21. And now we'll move on to the report and presentation, Operational Efficiency Report. Dr. Scribner, do you Thank have a few words to say? I do. Thank you very much, uh, President Jackson and Fort Worth School community. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, to acknowledge um, Trustee uh, Norman Robbins, uh, the leadership of the Eamon Carter Foundation and the Sid Richardson Foundation, who all helped us arrive uh, at a recommendation to undertake an operational efficiency study and tonight's report. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Elsie Shiro, who will uh, introduce our guests, and uh, we think we have a very, uh, uh, very interesting report uh, to present to you. Elsie. Yes. Uh, President Jackson, uh, Dr. Scribner, thank you for that, and, and members of the board. Tonight, uh, we are really anxious to introduce to you ERS. Uh, as you know, back in September, uh, the board approved that they come in and do an operational efficiency audit. They have been working steadily for the last eight months. 
we've provided them volumes of information and they have dialogued with any number of uh, our personnel and focus groups and with surveys. Um, and so tonight uh, you're going to have a presentation. Uh, last evening you got a full report and so this evening it's going to be a condensed report. Uh, and so, and also tomorrow, there will be time set aside for the board to meet with ERS to answer any additional questions that may not be answered this evening, or if you want to deep, uh, dive a little deeper into the information, you're certainly welcome to please join us uh, tomorrow for that uh, presentation, a further presentation. So, without uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce ERS to you, and we have Jonathan Travers and Emily Parfait, and uh, I, the I just want to welcome them and thank them for their work, and if you can proceed. Thanks, Elsie. Uh, President Jackson, Dr. Scribner, members of the board, good, e good evening. Um, for the last eight months, as uh, Elsie said, uh, ERS has partnered with district leadership to identify opportunities to more efficiently use the limited resources we have to better achieve uh, goals for our students. In so doing, we've identified six big areas uh, six big ideas for greater efficiency and effectiveness that we think, uh, uh, representing more than 50 million in potential resources, that we think leadership can take on to improve its stewardship of public funds and to improve outcomes for kids. Tonight, I'm excited to be able to share with you a summary of our analysis and offer some insight into the types of actions, reallocations, changes in process, changes in structure, and deeper inquiry that we think Fort Worth ISD should explore to better use its resources in service of outcomes. To do so, I'd like to speak very briefly to our project design and our approach to the work, and then spend most of the time this evening going through these six big ideas, giving some examples of what we saw in our analysis and what, act and what actions uh, we think Fort Worth ISD should explore uh, moving forward. I also look forward to, be, to being able to engage with you directly and go over our, our full report uh, with you tomorrow as you see fit. So first, what do we mean by uh, efficiency? Um, it may be an obvious point to those uh, of us that are working in the trenches uh, every day, in the work every day, but it's really important to start with the end in mind. The goal of this work is ultimately about delivering the highest quality education to all students while optimizing the use of scarce resources. So to be clear, the goal is not to get the same results we've always gotten at a lower price point, at lower cost. It's actually to improve teaching and learning and the student experience in our schools. It's prescient then, then uh, that the board and district leadership have engaged in this effort now. Fort Worth, like many districts across the country, is facing what ERS thinks of as a triple squeeze. We've got a higher bar or greater sense of urgency around improving outcomes than we've had before. Our cost structures in the absence of intervention are upward sloping, meaning that it costs us more money each year just to continue doing what we've done in the past. And we've got flat or maybe even decreasing revenue so the slope of our revenue line doesn't match the slope of our, expense, of our expenses. So if resources matter like we know they do, then the only way we're going to meet our, our, the only way we're going to meet our responsibilities for student learning is by looking deeply at what we're doing with our resources, not assuming that just because we've always done it in a certain way that we need to keep doing it that way, and figuring out ways to reinvest our resources where they're most likely to Im impact outcomes uh, for all students. So the purpose of this project very much aligns with ERS's mission. Uh, we're a nonprofit working with large urban districts across the country to transform how they use resources, which we define as people, time, and money, so that every uh, school prepares every child, uh, no matter their race or income. Through supporting districts like Fort Worth in this kind of work over the last 15 years, we've learned a lot about how schools and systems need to use their limited resources to most effectively serve all students. We've learned that success at scale means organizing resources in schools to provide students experiences that are tailored to their needs. Uh, that while schools are the unit of change, we must also be intentional about the design and use of resources of the system. Uh, and ultimately, and really importantly, it's not just how, mu uh, how much or how many resources you have, uh, it's about how well those resources are used. And we see dramatic differences in outcomes uh, across schools and systems between those that are more and less effective with the resources they have. Engaging in this kind of work in multiple places across the country gives two benefits to this project that are worth noting up front and that speak a little bit to our approach and methodology. First, we've assembled a pretty powerful uh, comparative data, uh, database of comparative data. 
So we can hold up uh, for districts for districts like Fort Worth how their spending, their configuration of people, time, and money are similar uh, to uh, or indifferent to other systems of similar sizes or with like demographics. To be clear, differences uh, to comparative data aren't inherently good or bad. But if for, uh, if, for example, we are spending more on a certain function or a certain activity than we typically see in comparable systems, we'll want to know and be confident that this difference is part of a deliberate strategy and not an unintended consequence of some other practice that we're not aware of. So I'll touch uh, on a couple comparative analytics tonight uh, uh, to illustrate and would be happy to talk more about the comparative districts and their data as part of our separate sessions tomorrow. The second point uh, is that so many of the districts that we've worked in have wrestled with the same kinds of challenges and resource misalignments uh, that we identified through this work with in Fort Worth. So we're able to share, uh, to also share with leadership some of the lessons, good and bad, from what other districts uh, have done. So let's, uh, so let's uh, get uh, into our approach uh, and methodology. Uh, this slide lays out uh, our major buckets of analysis and a rough timeline going back now about eight months uh, since project kickoff. As you can see on the left, uh, our methodology is a combination of qualitative and quantitative. We talk to people across the system, as Elsie said, uh, from cabinet members to focus groups of executive directors, school principals, uh, across all school levels, teachers and students, so we could hear from them how the current allocation and use of resources works for them or not, uh, and what ideas they have to improve the use of resources. We collected data through a survey of teachers and a separate survey of principals, both which had strong response rates. We also analyzed lots of school system data, from school and district spending to HR to course schedule and student achievement data across all schools to try to link resource use to what students experience <coughs> and ultimately uh, to, outcome, to outcomes. So we think we've uh, um, assembled a pretty robust picture of resource use for school year 1819 in Fort Worth, and frankly, lots of different stakeholders' perceptions of it. Well, one of uh, this project's great strengths, and I think one of our uh, ERS's greatest assets, is, the, is our quantitative sophistication. I would just acknowledge that, our, that my favorite part of this project, and frankly, feedback that I would give to you as board members, uh, is the passion, urgency, and commitment of the people that we spoke to. So uh, this, is, this is the wrong deck. So I'm going to keep going. Uh, you have the, the right deck in front of you. We'll, uh, we'll get that corrected in a second. Um, but just to skip ahead a bit, just to indulge one brief illustration, um, we started our focus groups by asking each of the focus groups, group members to use three words to describe Fort Worth ISD or their school in Fort Worth ISD. And their answers are represented here. I'd make two observations about the words that you see up on the screen here. Um, first, as system leaders, you should know that the words that, they, that, um, that were used most frequently, those that are in the largest font, <coughs> words like dedicated, collaborative, uh, supportive, um, are, are words that I think you can be proud of, that reflect the caring and commitment that students and staff have for their schools and systems. The other point I'd make is that you can see from some of the smaller words uh, that were only cited once, words like demotivating, fran frantic, stagnant, uh, that people were really candid with us about their feelings. Um, and you'll see throughout this report where we've incorporated specific anonymized quotes from the focus groups or surveys to let you hear directly from the people that we spoke to. Um, the last thing I'd say on this is just on a personal note. Um, the high school students that Emily and I got to hear from in our focus groups were just so incredibly insightful and sophisticated in describing what they see uh, in their schools and reinforced for me that the system's greatest assets, holding aside your billion dollar budget, uh, are in fact the students that you're serving every day. Uh, their contributions made this project substantially better and I hope that this project can in turn be used to make their experiences uh, better as well. So let's catch up to where we were. Uh, so let's get into it. Six big ideas representing more than $50 million in annual operating spend for greater efficiency to improve outcomes uh, for all kids. To be clear, as I said before, our full report goes into each of these areas in detail, laying out for each area what we know from research and national experience, what effective and, effective, uh, effective and efficient resource use can look like. Uh, we go into insights on how current patterns in Fort Worth ISD may diverge from best practice, 
and what actions or next steps we think Fort Worth ISD should explore uh, moving forward. Tonight, I'll give a brief summary of each of these six big ideas and then give a, uh, and illustrate them with a specific insight or finding from each. So, huh. are we good going off script here? Are we good just going with the handouts? While we catch up on the, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so big idea number one, um, the opportunity here is to align and integrate uh, current investments in academic strategy. There are a bunch of different pieces to this. Uh, so let me first talk about what this means broadly, and then we'll double click into an illustration in this red box here, the piece on the PD investment that we, that is right now focused on travel to external conferences. Um, so what do we mean by um, academics, the pieces of an academic strategy? Um, and what do we know from research are these essential pieces of it? Uh, the core pieces of academic strategy that enable high quality instruction and teacher professional learning are lifted on the left here. Rigorous and aligned curricula and assessments, structures that support content-focused, uh, content expert-led collaboration, and frequent growth-oriented feedback. This comes out of research uh, that we did commissioned by the Gates Foundation uh, two years ago on what the most innovative systems in this space were doing. We then, in this graphic, then lay out what the professional learning activities are within each of these three areas and the types of investments uh, that Fort Worth is making in each. So we see uh, the categories, activities, investments. Um, now let's, let's, let's look at investment levels. You can see that nationally, if you compare the typical to the strategic columns further to the right, you'll see that the typical systems nationally just don't invest in these areas enough to make a real difference. There's a, a, a bunch of research out there that I'll talk more about that says that traditional PD, that investments in professional growth don't work, that we don't actually improve uh, as we advance uh, in teaching effectiveness. Um, the big driver, one big driver of that is that we're just not investing enough in the right things to make a meaningful difference. We see that nationally. Now, what was interesting to us about Fort Worth ISD is, in fact, your investment levels rival are largely aligned with what we see in these strategic systems across all three of the areas. So we think that the important question for Fort Worth ISD in this space is not about how much, but rather how well. We go into each of these items in the full report, um, but these are great examples of places where our focus groups and our survey responses give pretty clear signals uh, that current investments aren't aligned or being structured in ways that set up teachers, that set up uh, professional growth for success. For us, this means uh, digging into, um, as I was saying, not just how much, but how well these resources are being aligned and used. One area that stood out to us as being significantly different than we see in other systems, and just to touch on this a little bit more deeply here, um, and frankly that runs in conflict with the research on effective practice in professional development related spending, uh, is the district's investment in PE travel and conferences. Rel relative to comparative districts, Fort Worth ISD spends 2.9 million more uh, in this area. This runs counter to what we un understand from research, as I said, and remember, as summarized on the top right here, when teachers travel for conferences, the cost isn't just the travel and registration fees, the cost is also in missed or lower quality instruction uh, from subs, not to mention the incremental cost of the subs as well. When we talked to principals, uh, to teachers and principals about this, they affirmed that it was in fact fairly common practice uh, here. But we heard, and we also heard a couple things that I think are, warrant a direct mention uh, with you. Uh, first is that getting to go to these conferences is, for many teachers, part of the value proposition uh, of them being in their role. Um, so simply mandating no more PD conferences uh, isn't likely to go over well, and in fact may push away some of our most effective teachers that we need to focus on retaining. Second, we heard that sometimes schools spend money on conferences because they can meaning that there are such significant barriers to using funds in other ways that even though they'd like to use the money in other ways, uh, procurement or staffing barriers or obstacles get in the way. So conferences end up being a little bit of a, of a purchase of last resort. So moving forward, what do we think that the district should do? 
uh, this slide lays out potential action implications for all of the pieces that we describe in this section uh, 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 in the full report. Uh, and these are really important. At the end of the day, it's likely, I would say that at the end of the day, it's likely that simply by getting these other investments in professional growth strategy uh, aligned and working well, that we will greatly reduce the need for outside, the perceived need for outside PD uh, spending and conferences. But for now, let me just speak to the action implications associated with this, uh, with this line, with this road directly. The principal feedback to us was pretty powerful. Uh, and we think that there may be an opportunity simply to make other uses of funds more viable. Second, it may be that teachers and uh, school leaders just don't have a robust understanding of this very specific research uh, in this space. And engaging them, uh, in this with them may lead them to make different decisions about how, uh, how they can exercise their discretion around their funding uh, on their own. And then lastly, we would encourage Fort Worth team members to engage with other systems on this question. Schools and lots of other systems across the country, uh, in Texas and across the country, have similar needs, training large groups of teachers on common courses or a specific curriculum or on a specific instructional strategy. How do, these, uh, how do these schools and these other systems do this? And with what implication for teacher practice and teacher satisfaction? And what, therefore, can we learn from their experience and apply to us uh, here ourselves. So uh, big idea number one, um, aligning and integrating current investments in academic strategy. I want to shift to our second big, uh, big area of focus, optimizing a spend on the signature aspects of schools of choice and programs of choice. Um, and to start, I, I would say that I wish you all could have heard the excitement in the voices of, of the high school students that we spoke to uh, when they were talking about the signature aspects of what makes their school uh, so special. For almost all of them, as we went around the table that, uh, that, that afternoon, it had something to do with what we think of as the signature aspects of schools of choice or programs of choice within the comprehensives. These schools or programs of choice stand out to us as being really core to Fort Worth ISD's strategy, in fact, more than we see in other systems uh, where we work. And their comments just underscored for us the importance of really making sure we've got our, our resources optimized behind these signature um, parts of these uh, schools. So tonight, I'd like to share just uh, one illustration of this uh, with, uh, that focuses on um, optimizing resources within uh, schools of choice. So, quick note on methodology. Part of our process is to calculate the per pupil spend at each of the schools in the district overall and then controlling for differences in student need across schools. To be clear, we know that equitable is not equal and that's not the point. Uh, rather, we want to make, make sure and help leadership make sure that where we are spending more or less at individual schools or groups of schools, that it's a deliberate difference driven by equity or by the unique program model uh, of the school. Fort Worth ISD uh, had three schools of choice that stood out to us as having exceptionally high per pupil spends. In fact, for high schools, I think these were the three that had the, the highest a dollar per pupil. Young men's uh, world language and young women's. Uh, and you can see here uh, these total per pupil amounts uh, on, the, uh, on the right um, compared to the $8,800 per pupil as the comprehensive school average uh, on the left. And these higher per pupil amounts for each of these three schools together translate to about $4 million uh, in additional cost, in cost above and beyond the comprehensive school average uh, uh, annually across the three schools. So to what extent uh, are these extra investments being directed to the core or signature aspects of the program? Um, our analysis showed that um, all three, oops, uh, our analysis, There we, there we go. Okay, um, our analysis showed that um, that across all three schools, uh, you have significantly smaller class sizes. Um, you can see those going across the bottom, uh, 11 on average at young men's compared to an average of 22 in the comprehensives. So the question for us arose: To what extent are smaller class sizes in these smallest in these small schools a core part of the program, part of that signature um, uh, program model? Uh, we think that at least in part, 
these smaller classes may be due to a breadth of, a breadth of offerings that may in fact be unrelated to the signature program. This chart is complicated, but it shows a really important difference between the schools of choice and comprehensives. Simply put, across every subject, schools of choice offer more courses per 100 students than comprehensives do. So just, how you un uh, just so you understand how to read this, I think this is the single most complicated chart we're going to be sharing with you tonight. So just to be clear on how we read this, uh, comprehensive schools on the upper left uh, offer 1.8 ELA courses per 100 students. So you can imagine in a 1,000 student comprehensive school, this would translate to 18 uh, English courses uh, total. In contrast, the schools of choice offer just less than double that. So young women's, you can see, is at 2.5 courses, ELA courses per 100 students, a little bit higher. Young men's is at 4.7 per 100. Now, part of this may, in fact, be a function of the school's program, like at WLI. I would hope that a school called World Languages Institute would, in fact, have uh, many more foreign language courses offered uh, per 100 students than the rest of the schools in the portfolio. And you can see that, 12.3, relative to a much lower average in our large comprehensives. Um, uh, but we suspect from this analysis that some of the breadth of offerings in these schools may, in fact, not be associated with the signature program. And having all of these different courses results in fewer students in each class uh, and lower average class sizes. I, I would also use this, um, uh, just say one further point here, just to make a general point about the role of small schools of choice uh, like these in a district's overall choice strategy. The premise that we see nationally around these themed small high schools is that they seek to provide choices to students from across the district that if a student is interested in the school signature program, then she should choose to enroll at that school. But then once she's made that choice, then it's a pretty, for, pretty uniform experience and the set of, and uniform set of offerings that students receive. The choice, the choice narrows greatly at the schoolhouse door. In contrast, the choice strategy for large comprehensives uh, is more about having the scale to offer a range of options to students once they get to that schoolhouse door. So students who aren't ready to commit to a narrower focus or want to explore multiple pathways should have their needs met in a large comprehensive with a much broader set of options because they've got the scale to do that. And one challenge that we see is that, an effort, that in an effort to make equal equitable, small schools will seek to, make, uh, seek to offer more different choices in offerings than they really have the scale for, the demand for, or in some cases the expertise for. And that, as a result, that may ultimately divert attention and resources away from the small school's signature program. So to move forward, we're recommending a deeper review with the schools of choice that unpacks their course, course offerings more deeply and then ensures that the extra spend in these schools really is directed toward the true signature aspects of the program. Okay. I'm going to stick with uh, high schools to say a little bit more uh, in big uh, in uh, focus area number three, maximizing the value of secondary schedules to ensure graduation, uh, on time graduation and deeper learning. Um, we think that there's a, a series of opportunities to better use resources to maximize the value of secondary schedules uh, to, on, uh, to ensure on time graduation and deeper learning, as I said. One really important uh, reason for shifting to the eight period day was to improve on-time graduation by giving students more opportunities to meet graduation requirements in four years. So the challenge is how to do that and ensure the kind of deeper learning experiences that are so important uh, to be in career and college ready. In our, in our full report, we touched on some opportunities to evolve processes and supports that I think are really important to enable more strategic scheduling at the high school level. Here, I'll just touch on one dynamic of scheduling that relates uh, to non-core uh, non uh, breadth of course offerings, non-core subject breadth of course offerings. To do this, I again want to talk a little bit more about class sizes, specifically how class sizes in core subjects, meaning ELA, math, science, and social studies, compare to class sizes in non-core subjects in your large comprehensive high schools. In Fort Worth, as you can see all the way on the left here, your average class size for core subjects is 23 students. For non-core, it's 20. Three students less, 15% less. This difference is in contrast to what we see in other districts, 
where the core and non-core class size averages are the same, both at 23. This means that, relative to other districts, Fort Worth is spending 15% more on class size for non-core subjects relative to core. This is also well below the stated staffing ratios in non-core to the tune of about $10.8 million uh, for comprehensive system-wide. After looking closely at the data and hearing from, fo from focus groups and in interviews, we suspect that this prioritization of spend isn't a deliberate class size reduction strategy, but instead the consequence of a proliferation of non-core uh, course uh, subject offerings. So to illustrate the, uh, this a little bit more deeply um, uh, and focusing on CTE, uh, career technical education courses, since that's the single biggest chunk of non-core course offerings in high schools, uh, we see here that the more, choice, the more choices students have in CTE course offerings, the smaller those CTE class sizes are. Again, how to read this slide. Each of the dots uh, rep um, represents one of your comprehensive high schools. And you can see uh, that the schools that offer the most different CTE courses per 100 students enrolled, uh, those are all the way on the right there, they then also tend to have the smallest CTE classes. Now, we know right now uh, uh, that CTE pathways and the course offerings is a current focus of district leadership with high schools uh, right now. So we suspect that this may be on track to look different uh, to, to some degree for 1920. Uh, but we think that there's a continued focus around helping schools narrow course offerings to better focus on the needs of students as they prepare for college and career. And I would offer the list uh, shown here uh, would offer this up as a set of guiding principles uh, that we think may be helpful to help district leaders work with schools to prioritize course offerings that they'll in fact have, uh, that will in fact have the greatest impact. So um, that next step uh, summarized here. And so that's uh, uh, big idea number three, maximizing the value of secondary schedules to ensure on-time graduation and deeper learning. I want to pivot now for, to big idea number four um, around maximizing and making sustainable uh, community partnerships. One of the strengths of this system that we observed is its, is its ability to attr attract and engage with community partners to most effectively serve its students. So I'd like to dig into one specific um, opportunity here um, uh, that focuses on engaging our community college partners in providing dual enrollment options for Fort Worth ISD students. I said earlier that three of your smallest schools, schools of choice, are your three most expensive per pupil. Your other three smallest schools, uh, all with enrollments of less than 400, um, are significantly lower spending and are your, in fact, your dual enrollment high schools. Looking at these dollar per pupils was an interesting finding for us given that we see nationally high schools, these small high schools like these tend to be 20 to 25 more expensive than large, 20 to 25% more expensive uh, uh, than the large comprehensives. And it was made even more intriguing uh, by the fact that, um, that the performance in these schools, uh, as noted here through these ELA growth rates, are well above average. In these dual enrollment situations, the cost of class is less than when, uh, is less when students, take, uh, students take the class through one of the community college partnerships than when Fort, than when Fort Worth provides uh, the, the class directly. If we're feeling great about the outcomes um, students are experiencing from these offerings, then it only makes sense that Fort Worth should try to expand access to these offerings to additional students. So that's what we really see as the action implication here, exploring how to, exp uh, exploring how to expand access to dual enrollment opportunities uh, for more students. Shifting to big idea number five, streamlining central resources provided to schools. Um, and I'll, I'll illustrate this with um, an example from parent engagement where there are two different departments placing centrally managed resources in schools that in total double what we roughly, uh, that, that in total roughly double what we see as the level in, of investment in comparative districts. So first a note on the overall spend. As I said, uh, it's double on a per pupil basis what we typically see. 
uh, to the tune of about $4 million, to over $4 million, uh, with a much higher share of that, of that uh, investment coming from Title I. In fact, 10% of all Title I spend in Fort Worth ISD is invested in the centrally managed parent resources, which is almost four times as much as we see in the comparative districts. To be clear, being different, higher or lower, isn't inherently a bad thing, but it is important to then to, to go deeper into the reason for that spend and make sure that what, we are in, what we're spending here is deliberate and effective in getting the outcomes that we want. So what is, that ex what is that higher spend by us? There are two, in interviews with staff, we learned that there are two distinct efforts related to parent relations that we heard about. Uh, one is in the early learning department that engages with families with zero to three aged children. Those are in blue, those 50 FTEs. And the other is in family, in family communications department that engages pre-K to 12 families across the district uh, in, in, in the, the green through the variety of positions uh, that are shown here. Our watch out and potential action implication is to ensure that these, these resources are in fact aligned and that parents and schools receiving services experience them as a seamless and, and integrated resource. So moving forward, we would recommend uh, that Fort Worth explore consolidating engage, uh, parent engagement resources to be under a single umbrella so that parents have a seamless experience as their children come into and move through the system and really, I would just hold up more broadly this theme of, uh, the, the, of sort of seamless experience and alignment across function, across departments that cuts across a number of resources that are managed centrally, but also play out in schools. Okay, our, 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 last big, our sixth and last big idea is full efficiency in central administration. Um, across lots of uh, districts where we work, we often hear a perception that there's a bloated, bloated bureaucracy and the central, admi uh, central administration spend has got to come down. And certainly, uh, we think that focusing central admin consistent with the district's vision for the role of central and benchmarking central admin spend are critical for districts to push toward full efficiency in this area. So uh, what does the fact base for Fort Worth tell us? Um, and to be clear, this is not looking at resources that are controlled centrally, but rather uh, that play out in schools that are covered uh, in big idea number five, but rather in, in the pure administration or, or overhead costs uh, that we're looking at here. So, uh, so what, what do we see here? Um, on an apples to apples basis, using our methodology across districts, we count 7.6% of the district's operating spend as central administration or what we, what, we, what we think of as leadership and management you know, using our coding nomenclature. This is a full point lower than the comparative district average, uh, though certainly not the lowest. So while we encourage system leadership to look closely at central spending to ensure it's efficient and focused on supporting schools, it's worth noting uh, that we don't expect the district will be able to free up lots and lots of dollars in this area to invest back into schools. <coughs> Going a little uh, deeper, nonetheless, if you double click into that 7.6, you can see across each of the different functions centrally how the spending on cent uh, how the spending compares to comparable function the comparable function in in other in other systems, um, and we see that uh, uh, that in fact there are a few functional areas um, as we define them uh, all the way on the left here uh, where Fort Worth ISD's spend and staffing levels are higher than we see in our comparison districts. So as I said, looking all, all the way on the left, you can see three central functions that have the greatest extra spend in Fort Worth, curriculum development, parent community relations, and career ac and academic counseling. To be clear, these are ERS defined functions that in some cases line up pretty, pretty closely with departments here, in other cases cut across multiple uh, departments. The extra spend in these three areas works out to about 6.3 million more than we see uh, in our comparative district average. I should also point out here that in our appendix, in our full report, we've got a lot more function-based uh, function analytics to compare Fort Worth ISD spend to uh, other comparative districts, and I am happy to engage in going in much, into much more detail with you in that tomorrow in our small group time if you're interested. So final point here, to be clear, we're not saying that being higher than comparison districts is inherently inefficient, as I said. In fact, higher spend may be strategic if the service quality out and outcomes that we're receiving from that extra spend are exceptional. But in at least a couple cases here, um, we, uh, it may be that the management responsibility of school-based resources is fragmented across departments 
And as a result, and that is in fact resulting in a slightly higher spend in management than we would otherwise see. So uh, moving forward, we do think that the spending in these targeted areas warrants deeper scrutiny, especially in the run up to the 2021 budget development cycle uh, to see and to validate in fact, uh, whether the, the current spend is in fact efficiently aligned with district strategy. So we've laid out six big ideas uh, that, that cut across school-based spend uh, and central. Um, we hope that this work creates a strong fact base from which the district, from which district leadership can engage critical stakeholders uh, for how to move forward. I'd say just process-wise, we think that this has implications for how system and school leaders use resources in the coming year, in school year 1920, but would also encourage leadership here to engage in more long-term long planning uh, this summer and then to, to make more, some more significant changes through the SY 2021 school planning uh, and budget development cycles as well. Just a, a couple notes to close. I, I'd like to thank the superintendent, Elsie uh, uh, Karen, um, and the district leadership team for their active participation with us along the way, and all the other staff and students who contributed uh, to this analysis. Uh, in closing, I think there is lots of hard work ahead to realize the impact from this work, uh, but we're confident and frankly excited about the potential for this system to make the most of its limited resources in service for kids, uh, service of students. Look forward to questions and to being able to spend more time with each of you as you see fit uh, on this work tomorrow. Trustee Dr. Ann Sutherland. It's a really interesting report, and uh, it's the most comprehensive one I've seen. I appreciate your doing it. I think it was Dr. Scribner's idea. It was a very good idea. I have three or four little questions and one big one. Um, the big one is, did you, uh, I noticed that you worked in percentages, which I would also, but um, did you compare the actual amount of money that the different districts have? I remember hearing some years ago that, that um, Austin had $5,000 a student more than we did. And so how did that, how would you think that would affect the findings in your report? Yeah, um, well, we deliberately chose uh, comparative districts that have similar funding levels. Okay. Uh, so that was one of the criterion for figuring out who we ought to compare to. Okay. Uh, there's an, there are analytics on this in the full report that lay out a little bit more about comparative districts. I'm happy, as I said, tomorrow to sort of go through those uh, in more detail. Uh, we do think, so we, we did look at dollar per pupil differences it, uh, overall, and then also the percent differences. We think that looking at percents is sort of an easier shorthand way. People se seem to think about, oh, it's 5% more, 10% more. $12 per pupil is a tough thing for folks to translate more in real time. So, you know, it was just uh, a little bit more of just facility of communication yeah, that I, led us to use the percentages. I just wondered, okay, a couple little things. Um, you'd, I don't remember that you commented on ele elementary class size. You may not know this, but we have been stripping our se secondary schools for the last two, maybe going on three years of staff and not doing it to elementary kids at the same time as our secondary enrollment is increasing and the elementary increase is decreasing. Um, have you looked at that? I think it's quite significant and uh, probably should have some bearing on it. And in fact, I would support uh, going back and taking a look at the impact of that if, if you think it's important because it's I've been told that some of the elementary classes are pretty small mm -hmm. uh, we, we did look at that you did okay. uh -huh. um, and um, by by um, consequence of being uh, in in Texas uh, you have class size maximums at the right. elementary level that are frankly lower than we see in other d states across the country particularly those with comparable funding levels uh, with the kinds of low funding levels that, that exist here in Texas. Uh, so one of the challenges is then, therefore, you do have smaller class sizes at the elementary level than we see in many of the other systems outside of Texas. Uh, and, um, and, uh, but they aren't so far below the caps that we think that there's significant opportunity to push up. It is a cap per class. It is not an average school-wide. Right, I know. So particularly where you have very small elementaries, and, and if we're going to sort of toe the line on, um, what's the term we use here? Not multi-grade classes? Uh, Bridge. Bridge classes. Bri bridged classes. Right. So we're going to toe the line on that. We're going to have a hard time pulling up on elementary class sizes with, <coughs> without either conflicting with state policy or your bridge policy. 
Okay, I have a couple more little things. I was glad, I was glad you looked at the programs of choice and the cost. Um, I also think that um, a lot can be done with that. And finally, on page 30, you began talking about the central administration. You don't have to look it up. Uh, what is your definition of central administration? Some of us have had a disagreement over what the definition is. So I need to know what your definition is because I want to know if you agreed with me or the other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's pressure. Yeah, you don't know the answer yet. Uh, um, well, um, we've got a little bit more uh, detail on this in our methodology uh, section in the appendix. Um, and I'm happy to go over sort of the almost row by row. I just need to know what the definition of central administration yeah. is. So conceptually, we'd say it is um, activities that are conducted centrally that pertain to the leadership and management of the system that do not provide direct services to schools or students. So, for example, I would not include uh, tra I would not include uh, the, 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 the parent coaches that we were talking about, the, the, the parent coordinators that we were talking about before. They are managed centrally, but they play out in schools. That isn't central administration. The management of those resources is central administration, but those parent coordinators are not part of it, even though they're going to show up on your central budget. So you, you sorted by the job assignment rather than by the location. Exactly. So we looked very specifically not just at what department is, is the, is the is dollars uh, budgeted or expensed to, but what are the positions, what do they do, and is that a management function or is that a direct service function? Yeah, I appreciate very much the report and Dr. Scribner, you're putting on us a very nice piece of work and uh, I think we'll learn a lot from it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland. Trustee Norm Robbins. Thank you, President Jackson. Uh, wonderful, very thorough. I uh, had an opportunity to look at it this today, the, the full report, and uh, I'm just hopeful that, that, and I can't recall if our RFP to you all included this, but I hope you're in a position to guide us through some of this. I'm, I'm hoping that you're not just going to leave this with us and then we figure out how to go forward best we can. Um, many of the items that you touch on, uh, uh, individuals on this board have harped on for quite a while. So this is a very uh, refreshing thing for us to see that what we thought might be areas of inefficiency are indeed very sizable areas of inefficiency. So thank, thank you so much for that. But I am curious, can you, are you going to help guide us through this and help us sequ sequence the best way forward and that kind of thing? Uh, uh, Mr. Robbins, yes, as a part of, you know, our next steps, we're going to do a, you know, a deep dive into this massive report and to kind of do a corrective action plan, you know, by year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to have to, uh, we, we're looking to seek, you know, these resources to assist <coughs> us. So okay. we ensure that we certainly study and implement to the best of our ability these findings. Right. So yes. Right. Thank you. It's wonderful. Trustee Christine Moss. Thank you, President Jackson. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, it looks really in depth and uh, it really gives us a lot of good information. But I have a question about uh, page 18. You know, it, I noticed that you compared Fort Worth ISD to other areas not in Texas. And because Texas is so different and we operate different from other school districts across the country, uh, that was something that I thought about. Now, where is Lake? Uh, Florida. Florida. Lake County, Florida. It's a huge district and, and they compare to us, you're saying. Yeah. Knox. Tennessee. P Tennessee. And I know Oakland's California, <laughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. and Charlotte. Mm -hmm. yeah, Charlotte's a very special school district across the country, the different areas. And, and that's, all, that's what I'm questioning. Not that you've, you've, you've done a good job, but the only one in Texas is Austin. And Aldean. Pardon? Uh, Austin and Alde Aldean. Yeah, Aldean. And that's a real, real classy school district. But um, 
all the numbers that you came up with, it's, it's just a concern because when we travel across the country and we hear, hear their different programs and how they operate and, and they don't use the same standards as Texas because, you know, we have a different governor and he's special too. Uh, <laughs> So we do operate differently, and that's all I'm trying to say, than across the country. So I want us to make sure we take in consideration of that when we're looking at all the schools and how we, how we do things in Texas and look at the dollars and like that. I won't be here, but um, I just hope that you consider that. And whoever gets this seat, I'll make sure that they get this report so they'll learn all of this information and be able to support uh, the schools that's in the district that I serve. Thank you. Trustee Lou Abenos. Uh, thank you, President Jackson. Um, thank you for this report. So now that we have it, uh, what is the timeline to make sure that we, this report takes effect across the district? Um, we, we will be meeting as a leadership team, as we have throughout the process, getting preliminary findings. Uh, and then we're going to have to start prioritizing matters, uh, realizing that you can't take all of these on and accomplish them all at one time. So we're going to look at some of maybe the low hanging fruit to see what we can accomplish in the 1920 school year and then kind of map it out over time. And hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we're going to be able to come back to the board with, with an action plan. And uh, as Mr. Robbins suggested, I, I think it's going to be important that we seek some outside resources to help us with some of this. Because it is important work, and we really want to make sure that it gets implemented. And so hopefully within the next you know, couple of weeks, uh, we'll have a better outline uh, and a timeline so that we can ensure that we, we, we are able to accomplish uh, the many things that are included in this report. Thank you. And, and if, if I may, uh, President Jackson, uh, members of the board and uh, Fort Worth school community, we, we're very fortunate uh, here in Fort Worth um, to the po earlier point when uh, Trustee Robbins and Eamon Carter Foundation and Sid Richard Foundation resulted in us uh, um, conducting this uh, efficiency support. But, but the magic is in the implementation. And that is where the difficult decisions need to be made. Uh, we can kick the can down the road and not make difficult decisions or um, we can really take a step back and, uh, and get some guidance on how to implement these recommendations. There's some, there's some very, very important recommendations here, um, but it's going to take a uni uni unity among us. Uh, we need to maintain a clear focus, uh, have a tight alignment. For example, the course offerings. Um, we see that we have a great quantity of course, uh, course offerings, but perhaps because of that wide quantity, there's quality questions, and cutting courses are also are always tough, tough decisions. So moving forward, it'll be our system leadership, consultants, um, engaging stakeholders, uh, teachers, students, parents, uh, leadership, and, and board, so that we can listen, we can learn, and then we can lead. That's where the rubber hits the road, and that's why I think we're going to need some help implementing this uh, so that we don't, um, um, so we're going to have to deal with, deal with some tough decisions, and we don't want to kick the can down the road. Trustee Sutherland. I just have one more question. Somebody just sent me a text saying, is this going to be posted online? And if so, where? Yeah, we'll post it tomorrow morning, and we'll post it on our board site where we post our presentations. So, so we'll do the, board? the consolidated. Okay. The website. Thank you very much. Trustee Needham. Thank you, President Jackson. Um, this is a fabulous report. In all my years, I've never seen anything as comprehensive, and I, com I commend you, Dr. Scribner, for having it done, and your staff participating, and um, we have a roadmap here that shows us how to better use the um, finances that we have and how to better serve students. So I look forward to seeing, how, watching Christine and I watch you implement it. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, we three are going off. But, uh, and I looked at it this afternoon at home and thought, my goodness. But, 
um, and it was the Carter Foundation and the Richardson paid for, for this. They're, 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 the, they're gonna help, yes. Thank you all very much for your expertise and we're lucky to have this. Thank you, Trustee Needham. Thank you all for a very comprehensive report and thank you to staff for working so hard. I know it took extra time, but thank you. It was a great report. At this time, we'll hear public comment. Let me remind you that because of restrictions by the Texas Open Meetings Act, board members may not engage in a verbal exchange about a subject that has not been posted. We will listen and take notes, but the board is prohibited from responding to any inquiries made during a board meeting on any topic not posted on the agenda. However, the board may reply with one, a statement of factual information given in response to the inquiry, two, recitation of existing policy in response to the inquiry, or three, direct the person to visit with staff about the issue. While the board listens to concerns of a general nature and issues of common and individual concern, the board will not hear complaints about specific individual employees or public officers during public comment. Speakers shall refrain from mentioning names of individual employees or public officers during their comments. Any employee, parent, or other member of the public is asked to comply with the appropriate grievance policy to have a complaint heard pursuant to the applicable board policy. In accordance with board policy BED local, speakers shall have a three-minute time limit, and we ask that you please observe this rule. Furthermore, a speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another speaker. Delegations of five or more persons shall appoint one person to speak and present their views before the board with the time not to exceed five minutes. Because we have 16 speakers, I'm gonna ask you all to come down two at a time, taking each mic. Edward Perkins, Lizzie Maldonado. Mr. Perkins, if you would go first. Hi, is this good? Hi, my name is Edward Perkins. I'm a proud fourth generation Fort Worthian and a very concerned public citizen. I think we all agree today that kids deserve better and more nutritious food. And that's not where the contention is. So I don't want people to be fooled. The contention is why we're, or there's a proposal to sell out cafeteria workers to get there. When they're not the ones designing the meal plans, they're not the ones doing the purchasing, and they're not the ones that got in those awful convection ovens. It makes me think this isn't about nutrition at all, and it's not about kids. It's about a deep-pocketed multinational corporation hiring a politically connected lobbyist to get a lucrative contract by exploiting hungry kids. I know some of y'all may be worried about the supposed machine controlled by the spouse of the lobbyist, or as she put it herself on Facebook, Plan A. I know at least one trustee has been promised a six-figure contribution from the corporation to their pet project. I'm just here to let y'all know that it's not gonna be worth it. People are watching, teachers are watching, students are watching, other staff members, cafeteria workers, the Central Labor Council, the UEA. Um, so for those of you who want to sell out teachers or sell out cafeteria workers tonight and lead us further down the road of privatization for profit, I guarantee you this vote will haunt you until the end of your political career. Thank you. Ms. Maldonado. Hello, my name is Lizzie Maldonado. Hello. <laughs> um, and my son is a Fort Worth ISD student in the preschool program for children with disabilities in District 5. The deliberation you're making today about food services is similar to others that have changed the way disability programs are funded and serviced in the district in that you are being forced to do more with less. The, uh, we cannot pretend that this outsourcing will improve school lunches, bring jobs to the district, or reduce costs. You cannot claim to have good intentions while endorsing programs we already know to have bad outcomes. I understand that cafeteria workers would remain employed by the district for a short time, but as those jobs become vacant in the future, the share of outsourced jobs would only grow. Privatizing school cafeterias does not reduce program costs or improve nutrition long term. And in addition, they result in lost jobs, lost wages, lost benefits for workers, and lost program support when employees are paid less to do the same work. Because someone has to profit now, that profit has to come from somewhere. And it comes from the quality of food and the quality of jobs that run the program. I don't want cafeteria workers making less to do more because I know they'll pick up side jobs, they'll be tired without health insurance, they'll be sick, they'll have their minds elsewhere while providing a vital service for children in our community. 
Cafeteria workers deserve jobs with dignity. Students deserve balanced nutrition in school, not food for profit. And the district deserves a school board committed to understanding the evidence of previously outsourced programs. Use the best knowledge available and push back against privatization efforts that seek to turn our schools into profit mills with no improvement in services. Be relentless about pursuing alternatives to this terrible option. Four of your seats are up for re-election this year, and this is not the time to make an unpopular choice because a private business wants to dip their sticky fingers into one of the last remaining public coffers. Sodexo is a corporate parasite, and many others like it are the same, and there is no good reason or evidence to allow them near programs for our district's children that are essential. Fort Worth ranks one, uh, in one of the top 10 districts in the state paying six-figure salaries with close to $22 million paid per year to a handful of six-figure employees while the district's debt is more than a billion dollars. But even with so many so highly paid leaders, the only solution being offered is to cut the bottom line, to cut jobs and wages and benefits for some of the lowest paid workers in the district, and to take a gamble with vital services in the process. We must say no to Sodexo and Fort Worth ISD, no to private interests in public schools, and no to lost jobs, lost wages, and lost benefits for Fort Worth workers. If you need to save money so badly, start by taking from the superintendent's pay, not from cafeteria workers. Mr. Stephen Poole, Mr. Andrew Peter. Good evening, members of the board, uh, Ms. Jackson and uh, Dr. Scribner. I'm Stephen Poole with UEA. It has been an interesting road uh, that, le le that leads us to tonight where you're voting on a contract to outsource cafeteria employees. Uh, one thing that has impressed me throughout the entire conversation is that everyone who's been engaged in the conversation wants better food and better food options for students none more so than the hardworking cafeteria employees who basically say, give us the resources, give us the time, and let us cook. When the RFP was issued, I was not shy and our association was not shy in opposition. Where the current Fort Worth ISD cafeteria employees would remain, but as vacancies occur, they would be outsourced to a private company. I wanna thank Dr. Scribner for a conversation this morning where he shared that in the contract, not only will the current campus-based Fort Worth ISD employees remain Fort Worth ISD employees, but any future vacancies will be filled by Fort Worth ISD. Our concern was that these privatized positions would lose benefits and the communities and families that rely on them would be hurt. So I'm glad that Dr. Scribner and his public leadership, but I also know there was a lot of private leadership going on behind closed doors, led us to where hopefully our cafeteria employees can be respected. They do honorable work. And as I said before, they do the Lord's work every day for our children of Fort Worth ISD. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alexandra Cheka. Okay, I'm Andrew Teeter. Uh, I'm a former teacher from O.D. Wyatt High School. I've been a teacher overall for nine years in different capacities, and I'm here to talk about the food service contract as well. So if your intentions are to save money for our budget, that, uh, that doesn't make sense. Because once the district loses its ability to run its own food service program, what would stop them from raising the prices later on uh, like a monopoly situation? Uh, we have to depend on that contract or that company then. So the company will eventually cut costs either from the workers' salaries, the workers' benefits, or the costs of the food because of market pressures and profit motive. Uh, if your concern is about the quality of food being bad, then why do you doubt the ability of this democratic public institution for being able to solve it? I'm pretty sure that there are some smart people here uh, that know how to cook some pretty delicious food. Um, so that's just a matter of the purchasing supply and the quality of your ingredients and the recipes and all that. So I think that uh, Fort Worth ISD is an institution worth defending. That it should be leading an example of how to treat its employees and community fairly and respectfully. 
Fort Worth Public Schools should never give up its operations to private hands for whatever reason. It should just make those operations better. All food service employees are members of our community that deserve a living wage, along with hall monitors and custodian crew, all of them. The best way to protect that is by keeping these jobs within the district and guaranteeing them a good contract with benefits. Without all of these working people, then our schools could not run. So as all of you here are public servants, if your solution is to meet the needs of our public schools, is to take away that control and give it to the private companies, then uh, I don't think that you are fit to be running our school board of education. Mr. Norman Quigley. Go ahead, Ms. Cheka. Hi, I'm Ala Cheka. I'm a teacher here in Fort Worth ISD. Um, I was very interested to see the, some of the details out of this report, which gave us a lot of quantitative data, but I'd like to offer some qualitative data on the ground and address some of the, the special needs or the, the unique needs of a literacy classroom. Um, and I would say from the bottom of my heart, I understand that we're in a budget crisis. Like I really, I, I, I went to Austin in person a couple of weeks ago to ask our legislators for money. I truly understand. But before you increase my class size, I would rather have you cut everything else and have me teaching in a field with like a chalkboard slate and twigs. Um, I, I can't emphasize how much, um, you know, when it comes to literacy, these aren't building blocks. This is a constellation of skills. And for somebody like me who has a relationship-based pedagogy, I have 109 students. And if you ask me data for my students, I could tell you. Every kid who has trouble with inferencing, whose favorite book is Harry Potter, who insisted that they hated you know, reading but really they love graphic novels. But the reason I'm able to tell you that data isn't because of a spreadsheet from multiple choice from last year, it's because I meet one-on-one -on -one with every seventh grader every Monday and we have a reading conference. And in order to be an effective writing teacher, in order to be an effective reading teacher, I need to have that time and space to have a relationship with my students and know what their needs are and what their passions are. Um, and when you increase class sizes, you know, one of the words that he used was sustainability, but it's not sustainable for me as an educator to feel like I'm not able to reach my students or they're not getting my attention. Um, I had one year in a school here in Fort Worth ISD where I had a writing class of 35, and I know that when you're looking at number data, it feels like you can scale the work of an effective teacher by adding more students, and in real life, it burns, it burns somebody like me out. Somebody who is passionate about literature and learning, it weeds those people out and it attracts people to the profession who are like totally fine with 35 kids because it's just churn. Um, so I, I just, I, I understand that there's, there's, a, there's a financial reality, but I would just ask that you prioritize as much as possible um, making the conditions so that kids can 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 learn um, and and finally i would say like one small fallacy like in addition to feeling like you can scale the work of a teacher by adding more students it also i think sometimes feel that you can scale the work of a literacy classroom with technology and you can't i mean you can't if if technology is is one of the tools at the disposal of, of a teacher wonderful but you can't outsource what i do in a way, and if, if you could, you know, gosh, we would just all buy software and that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Melton Pace, Mr. Quigley. Let me first start off by saying thank you, uh, board members, for the hard work that you do for the kids in our district, and I hope that you keep on making wise decisions. My name is Norman Quigley. I'm with Fort Worth Education Association as well as a member of the board of directors of TSTA. But let me also thank UEA for going in and joining with us so that we can come together as a team to see if we can not do what's best for the employees of this district. The re let me get down to the reason that we're here. The reason we're here because we've been mismanaged. Our cafeteria has been mismanaged by our, um, by our diagnostician. What's been happening is diagnostician come together, put a plan together, <coughs> Uh, how the food is going to go for the district, and it goes all over. 
okay? So we came up with a plan. I'm asking that every cafeteria manager be able to cook their own food for their own campus as long as with, it's within the rules of the, um, of the district along with the diagnostician. As well, every cafeteria manager receive a dollar raise so that we may be able to fill the a la carte lines so that <clears throat> we may be able to fill the vacancies because right now we know people shop price. And right now I think we are like, a hundred or so cafeteria workers down. So I'm asking that it's not necessary that we fill the director's position, okay? Let's do go get quality diagnosticians that's gonna work with the campus and the managers and allow them to pick and choose the food that's best for their campus. They have the data. They know how much food they throw away at each campus. They know how much they save. Also in asking, let's try this for one year. Let's monitor it in six months. Let's see how it works. If it doesn't work, let's go back to the drawing board. Let me give you a comparison of what happens whenever we start outsourcing. I'm quite sure all of you are familiar with, uh, <clears throat> with the bus driver situation that happened in Dallas. For those who don't know, every employee of Dallas County is hired through Dallas ISD. Okay? So the employees are hired through Dallas ISD, you go work for Dallas County. Okay? Whatever reason, whatever happened, Dallas County lost the contract, all the employees were gone. I don't think that we can afford to lose the 800 and something cafeteria workers that we have now. I understand the logic. I understand what it looked like. I understand what it's saying. I'm just asking you to please vote no for item G14 for today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pace. Good, e good evening, uh, Dr. Scribner and President Toby Jackson and all the board trustees. Um, there is so much that I could say about an alarming event that was brought to my attention as a parent of children in 4th ISD and a husband uh, to an employee of 4th ISD. In the interest of time, I'll just say on behalf of the decent people of Fort Worth, I am disappointed and embarrassed by the petty and irresponsible online conduct of a longtime school board member. And what seems to be a very bitter attempt to invalidate a grievance brought before the board, this school board member posted it in a very public forum, the happenings of a policy mandated closed session. Now, I could be wrong, but it seems as if posting the details of a closed session in a public forum would be the antithesis to the purpose of the policy that requires certain things be discussed privately among the board. I uh, am unsure of what kind of behavior has been tolerated in the past by our school board members, but I personally, like, personally would like to assure you that those days are over. Uh, I and many other concerned parents expect that proper measures will be taken to discipline those members who have apparently gotten off track regarding the policy and the responsibility to set a good example for the students you have in your charge. I don't know. Uh, how we expect to lead our youth to maturity if we behave like children when we don't get our way. Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that for whatever time you have the privilege to sit on this school board, get it together. Brandy Pace <laughs> and LaJohn Penix. Good evening, Dr. Scribner, President Jackson, board trustees. Um, my name is Brandy Pace. I'm a teacher and a parent in the district. After my grievance was heard um, to the Tuesday at the last board meeting and the resolution read, the resolution read, I felt the board had shown that they took racial equity seriously as a systemic issue. I felt that the board had hurt me personally and acknowledged my experience as valid. Imagine my surprise upon finding a board member's public blog entry containing description of my grievance and closed hearing information with my name included. The board member still doesn't get the issue. It is clear that they did not consult my grievance documents, the recording of my level two hearing, nor did they listen to my opening statement. Calling my grievance unusual served to delegitimize the damage to me and the experiences of others who may have been in similar situations. The board member claimed to know the real reason for my grievance and that it wasn't to get justice for myself, but a plot by other trustees whom she accused of colluding to create the resolution that resulted. She is suggesting that I am under the thumb of board trustees. I filed my grievance myself to get acknowledgement and to effect systemic change. How disappointing to have a board member write to the public that my own grievance wasn't about me or any other parent of color. 
I'm outraged that after what I've gone through, this board member has gone to the public to show that everyone on the board is not, in fact, united in its efforts to address inequity. The board member voted for the resolution, then delegitimized the vote soon after the blog, in the, in the blog post. Had the board member felt it was worth the time to receive the equity training the district has provided and or join us at any of the racial equity committee meetings or events focused on equity, they may have had some understanding of the issues. This is literally the reason that minoritized people like me are often afraid to come forward. Shame on this board member for continuing the dismissive and reactionary behavior that results in parents and staff like me being at a disadvantage in our district. The audacity of the attempt to dismiss my experience as part of someone's agenda is offensive. I will not bow down to invalidation and I will not let those comments be used to turn attention away from the kind of change Fort Worth ISD needs to make in order to truly serve all populations. Great things are happening in Fort Worth ISD and I intend to help the district move forward in its goals toward equity for me, other staff, my children and the students whom I serve and care for. I'm grateful to be in this district and I expect nothing less than forward progress from it. Thank you. Tiffany Rogers. Good evening board members and superintendent. Uh, my name is Ms. John Pennis. Usually when I'm standing here, I'm standing here on the behalf of transportation. This time I'm standing here on the behalf of the, um, the cafeteria workers and the G14 uh, item on your agenda. I'm urging you to vote no on that G14. There's a lot of things in that REP that, I mean, it's a lot of stuff in there. You have to read about it. Um, you can't go through it. Uh, I mean, it just the whiz through it. It's, it's a lot of hidden stuff. So I'm asking you to take your time before you vote on this issue. We're asking also that you um, consider voting no on this issue. Also, um, outsourcing has been used in other places, such as um, in Houston. It, it's not working in Houston. ISD, um, they wrote a whole article on that. As far as uh, they dealt with inflating uh, counts of possible overbilling, and they also dealt with government. They had a problem with the federal government not um, paying all that they're supposed to deal with the federal government on their issue. Um, you also, what happened with them was, uh, let's see, excuse me. There's also false claims and stuff. It's, it's a lot of things that's going on with this, with this thing, outsourcing, and it needs to be really looked into before it's, for you quickly say yes and before a quick yes. And so I'm asking you to vote no on this uh, G14. I'll either put it on the back burner for a while till next year and, you know, because UEA and TSTA as unions, we, we don't agree on everything, but we have got together on this thing. We see the same eye to eye on this. That this is not a good for district or for our district, for our school district. Thank, thank you. The next two speakers will be Sultan Cole and Heather Leaf. I don't see Pastor Cole, so Ms. Leaf. Ms. Rogers. Good evening. Thank you for letting me address you. Um, I do appreciate the work that you all do. Um, often we come and speak when things don't go right or when we are not in support of something, and that is not why I'm here tonight. Um, I believe it is equally as important to say when something has happened right. Um, a few weeks ago, I got an invitation to a Partners and Volunteer Appreciation Luncheon, and maybe because it was on a day that I wondered if anything I did made a difference or, or maybe it was just because it was meaningful. Um, it really touched me and I want to say that I appreciate that Fort Worth ISD values volunteers and partners um, enough to show how we're affecting the big picture for our students. Um, it was a little different this year than in years past. I, I have had the privilege to go in the past um, and I really appreciated that you brought the partners and the volunteers together um, because it was I, I usually only see the PTA aspect of things um, as, as a member of PTA and as a leader in PTA. Um, so it was refreshing to see other groups all coming together for the same goal, which is our students. Um, so I encourage you to, to always remember that um, when someone feels appreciated, whether it's a volunteer or not, um, that they are obviously more likely to stay involved in the program. So I thank you for valuing our volunteers and our partners. Heather Leaf and Christopher Rogers. Good evening, Dr. Scribner and Board of Trustees. Um, I'm also here to discuss the food management um, services. I'm going to share a personal story first, though. I come from a strong military family. 
my husband, my father, my grandfather are all Air Force. And then I have cousins who are Navy and Marines. If you know anything about um, military members, they all kind of compete who's best, right? And um, my cousin once told a story about being on a nuclear sub with crates of food, and on the top it was stamped, Air Force rejected. My father took great joy in that story, claiming that Air Force was number one. My cousin has never lived it down. And of course, this is just a silly family competition and no true winners. They're all number one, right? Earlier tonight, I sent you an email with an attached story about Houston ISD. In 2017, they terminated a contract with one of the companies that's being proposed tonight. They terminated the contract in search of better quality, better nutrition, and more variety. Now Fort Worth ISD is considering a contract with this same company, and it feels a little bit, I'm gonna be honest, like Air Force rejected. Surely we can do better. Our child uh, nutrition staff has been here to several of the board meetings pleading, you, pleading with you to consider your decision, reconsider your decision to outsource these services. They are concerned for their jobs, student safety, and overall quality of the food that they serve to their students. Um, at our school, our cafe manager um, calls our students her babies. She means it. They love her. She and others are here tonight. They obviously care deeply about this decision. Their passion for our kids and their concerns about this issue has, has inspired me to speak on their behalf. So I come to you just to ask you to delay the decision and uh, refer it back to staff for further review. Thank you. Say when. <laughs> it's These when. microphones are always a little low. <laughs> Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Scribner, good evening. I am not with the company that lost the contract, and I am not with the company that the first guy talked about. You all know me. I'm with Chartwells. I've been coming here a long time. Most of you know my family are almost all educators, all of my childhood mentors, service employees, food service included. It's funny, my old company laughed at me every time I brought up Fort Worth. This is never going to happen was something I heard often. This may be my last visit to a Fort Worth ISD board meeting as my efforts to work with you will apparently fall short following the recommendation this evening. However, I thought I heard a reference to a material change in the way employment's to be handled, so we'll see how that goes. Nonetheless, I wanna just talk about three things about my relationship with you over these years, especially as it relates to child nutrition. One caveat when I say me, I may often mean my organization, so you'll understand. What haven't I done? What have I done? Why have I done what I've done? So first of all, what haven't I done? I, I never hired powerful people to try to exert influence. I never made highly publicized donations. I never relied on special gifts or outings. I never listened to people internal or external who suggested that the decision was made before it started. I believed in the integrity of your team and your process. I never focused on economic development, though I proposed including hundreds of thousands of dollars of our own dollars in support of the broader community. I never misled you. I never focused on anything but what I learned firsthand to be important to you. I never ever did anything that could potentially come back to haunt you. What have I done? I've made friends here. I've earned trust and respect. I've listened intently. I base my responses on you, not on me or what I thought. Many people here tell me that I know more about you in this process than anyone. That's probably true. I've listened and responded to concerns of CNS employees, including retention bonuses for all employees who stay on. Though I see HUB as a significant point in the agenda item tonight, it was not a requirement of the RFP. Nonetheless, I invoked our 21-year joint venture with the largest minority food service company in America, Thompson Hospitality, to deliver a far greater MWBE participation than you required. I have proposed investing not only the amount allowed by the RFP, but several million dollars more at our cost to ensure needed solutions, and I have both lived and sought equity, honesty, and fairness in all my dealings. Why did I do what I did? As I mentioned, most of my family is made up of educators. Those who know my story know it has always been about the students. For me, with the serious nod to developing and supporting those who serve them, as I mentioned, this may be the last time I attend a Fort Worth board meeting, so remember, I have always and only attempted to 
ensure that all students are served with equity and excellence, support and develop those who serve them, do the one thing that we do very well, do it right the first time. I thank you for your time and for your friendship over the years. Jason Smith and Morris Grundy. Trustees, Superintendent, uh, I'm Jason Smith. I'm the father of Sloan Smith, uh, who is a student in Miss Raymond's first, second, third grade class at Daggett Montessori. And I'm here asking you to help me show her how uh, we treat people who take care of us. Uh, we're lucky to have with us tonight Susan Wade and Paulette White, who are here in support of the cafeteria workers at Daggett Montessori. Uh, and they'll tell you that the food service employees of our district are part of the educational process. So they see the kids that need help. They see the kids uh, who need, who quite frankly, uh, need nutrition. Uh, and they talk to the staff. They talk to the kids. They interact with the parents. Um, they have a job that gives them a paycheck, that gives them a pension that gives them benefits like they can work at a school where their kids go to school because of the Fort Worth ISD preference. Outsourcing these jobs uh, not only does a disservice to, to them, but to our kids. I'm asking you to reject uh, the attempt to outsource food service jobs at Fort Worth ISD. Uh, if they are outsourced, uh, they're gonna make less they're going to be, uh, not be a part of the educational process. They're not going to have a pension. They're going to have worse health insurance. And quite frankly, uh, these food service companies have higher turnover, and I question whether we're really going to have better food service. Um, but uh, what we can do is um, we can uh, keep these positions. If you do this, if you outsource these jobs, Corporate America is going to come to you again and again and again. Next, it's going to be the bus drivers. Next, it's going to be the custodial staff. Because corporate America sees where the money is. It's called corporate welfare. That's what they want. And how do they make money? They cut labor costs, they cut pay, and they cut benefits. And these people don't deserve it for what they do to our kids. So. Help me show Sloan Smith that we take care of those, we walk with those who take care of us. Uh, a mentor uh, in college, Roberto Guerra, he was the first Hispanic county judge of Jim Wells County, uh, taught me a very important phrase, and it's dime con quien andes y tierra dire quien eres. And what that means is, Tell me, show me who you walk with, and I'll show you who you are. Walk with these people. Grundy. Good evening. President Jackson, Dr. Scribner, my name is Morris Grundy, an area supervisor of this district. I lead a team of six, uh, 116 employees at some of the Fort Worth ISD best schools. I am here on behalf of my team to address the district's recent decision to outsource the nutrition programs provided by CNS department. We believe the district decision to outsource nutrition service is short-sighted and myoptic at best. Skew metrics along with the survey of less than 1% of student population does not merit sufficient quantifiable data to make a decision impacting 85,000 students and over 900 employees. Across this great country and in our great state, other schools have implemented this initiative and it has yielded marginal results. It remains apparent that the homework was not done or at minimum to a passing standard when this short-sighted decision was suggested and or made. Our students participate um, high rates across this. All schools have adequately sustained our department, so why, again, outsource? Our department record speaks for itself. 
Child nutrition has proven to be an asset financially for the district, contri uh, contributing over one million annually to the general fund and costing nothing for the district. So again, I ask you, why outsource? Additionally, we have nothing less than the sterling assessments of our nutrition program for the state and USDA. Annually, Fort Worth ASD Child Nutrition Service approximately serve over 85,000 meals to students across this district. We have the staff of over more than 900 employees serving as partners in the district, which you all's goals, stating, educating our students to prepare them for success, college, career, and community leadership. That's what you tell us. We know our schools, the district, community, and outside vendor bidding at lower costs do not and cannot adequately support the mission of Child Nutrition Department. This is a flawed decision. Again, why outsource? From breakfast in the classroom, to after school snack, to fresh fruit, fresh fruit and vegetable program, are often the most nutritious meals that many of these students receive. Again, why outsource? Our employees know that these students have worked tirelessly every day to prepare and serve meals that enable our students to come to school and learn every day. So again, why outsource? Child nutrition is very vital to our students' well-being, and it's not function that should be used as a litmus test to... Thank you for Thank your time. You. Thank you. And our final speaker is Angie De Filippo. Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angie De Filippo. I am an organizer for Tarrant County Central Labor Council of the uh, AFL CIO. Yes. Uh, we represent over 23,000 people in Tarrant County. Um, I'm speaking about auto workers, office employees, steel workers, mechanics, and anyone else who deserve that has uh, organized their workplace for the benefit and respect in a union. Many of these people also have children here in the Fort Worth ISD area. They pay property taxes and they voted for all of you to represent them here today. Um, you may have also recognized my name from some of the emails you all have gotten over this past week. but. Um, when we heard about these efforts to privatize the respectable positions of those working in the cafeterias, it was frustrating to say in the least. These men and women work tirelessly and without many resources that would make their positions easier. To outsource their positions to companies that would have to renew contracts yearly would have been an inexcusable attack upon working families. Everyone deserves the right to sustainable and reliable work health benefits, living wages, and the ability to retire after putting in all these years of work. Not to have their positions whittled away by insecurity and poverty wages. We want to thank the working people of the Fort Worth ISD for being here and fighting for the right to be treated with respect. We thank the United Educators Association for the way they've stood up for their members and brought these issues to the board. And we want to thank you as well with the hopes that you will be standing up and saying that you respect the over 800 families that are currently being impacted by this decision and the 900 community members who will fill these positions in the future that will be free from another low wage grind and replace corporate entity that only looks to make profits profits off the lack off the backs of others sorry i get nervous um, <laughs> so moving forward, it's the time that we join working people, board members, communities, and labor to find a way to balance these budgets without slashing the wages and the benefits of working people in our communities. Let's start by looking at other school structures who have implemented new ideas, all while keeping those who do the labor in mind as well. One of the, like as a native Houstonian, I would like to say that um, there is a humble ISD. I went to Quest High School. And they actually use different integration for classes. So you had a homeroom class that you were in for all four years with new students. You had every student graduating with college credits. 
you also had every student graduating with a Presidential Community Service Award. So that would be one of the ones I would look into if you're wanting to implement some changes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Scrivener. Yes, President like Jackson, um, consistent with our policy, I'd like to uh, share some specific factual information. I was fortunate enough to interact with and um, greet several of the cafeteria employees here at the front door. Uh, tuve la oportunidad de saludar a algunos de ustedes y quiero que todos sepan la verdad de lo que va a pasar aquí. Um, the truth of the matter is we're not talking about um, outsourcing cafeteria workers. We're talking about outsourcing leadership. Uh, outsourcing the management and uh, identifying um, different ways to uh, buy better products and, and, and more uh, and better ingredients. Uh, cada empleado de, no, de nuestras cafeterías sentado aquí esta noche regresará en agosto como empleado de Fort Worth ISD. Será igual el siguiente año y también el siguiente año. Every employee here will continue to be a Fort Worth ISD employee. There is no need to have fear put in your hearts including the, 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 the point that, uh, that uh, Mr. Poole identified, that, that vacant positions will have the opportunity to work at Fort Worth ISD tam, uh, also. Uh, y nuevo, nuevos empleados también pueden aplicar y ser empleados de Fort Worth ISD. La recomendación no es subcontratar a nuestros empleados de, cafeto, de cafetería, sino, um, y tampoco los supervisores de cafetería. Lo que queremos es subcontratar la gerencia y liderazgo de las operaciones. I think it's important that we're very, very clear uh, and, that we, and that we speak the truth. And, um, and, I, and I appreciate everyone's concern about all of our cafeteria workers as I share that concern. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scribner. Uh, Dr. Ann Sutherland is on the screen. Let me just remind you, Dr. Sutherland, you can respond only with a statement of specific factual information given in response to an inquiry. I was going to comment on Dr. Scribner's statement okay. before people leave. Um, I appreciate the people coming down on this issue. It's a very big issue. There's a tremendous amount of emotion involved. Um, the, the, the information on this has been very late in coming. Uh, we got the packet last night at 8 o'clock or so. Um, some people think this is the culmination of a multi-year effort to degrade the quality of food service. I got one very fine letter from a food service worker who said that she watched it go down year after year as the movement to outsource increased gathering steam. Um, I, I appreciate Dr. Scribner's heroic efforts to bring consensus to this. It appears to me, though I haven't seen anything in writing, that we are going to save the jobs of the workers that we have, and we will have a chance to uh, hire workers for the vacancies that exist. It's not really clear to me what happens to the other 13 or 16 percent. Perhaps you'd like to comment on that again, Dr. Scribner. But there is, there is no reliable fiscal information on this $50 million contract. If it goes to $55 million, if they increase the, the number of people by 10 percent. And it's very unclear to me how the, how the fiscal impact of the funding interfaces with the bifurcation of the expenditure of the funds. And I'm extremely concerned about that. I asked for help this morning and again this afternoon twice. There's been no response whatsoever from the staff. And this makes me really, I, I, I had committed to, voted for, to vote for this if the employees were saved, okay? And it appears to me that this has happened. But at the same time, there's no information whatsoever on how this fiscal thing is going to play out. And as I said, I've asked for help on that twice, and it's got and this afternoon, let alone a week ago when we got ahead of real. Dr. I'm Sullivan. all done now. It, thank, it, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, Trustee I, I, Christine Moss. Thank you. I will wait until it comes up on the agenda. Thank you. We'll now recess and reconvene the board conference room.
reached 5.35 p.m. in the boardroom with quorum present. Recess to open session in the boardroom is now reconvened at 7.33 p.m. in open session in the board conference room with the quorum present. As board president, I'm making the following statement in accordance with board policy BBFA local. This is a reminder to all board members of the legal conflict of interest requirements and disclosure requirements you may have for matters under consideration on the agenda for this meeting. If required by law, board members shall recuse themselves from all discussion and shall abstain from voting on any matter pertaining to such a disclosure. Before moving to the discussion of the agenda items at staff's recommendation, item 8A5 is being pulled. Mm -hmm. yeah. 8A5 was the approval of a purchase of a public address system and cabling. We're going to postpone that. So are there any consent agenda questions or concerns? Trustee Luebenas. Um, page 94, approved for portions of secondary health education materials. Uh, 248, we have uh, 180,000 coming from the general fund and then the other stuff uh, from the special revenue. So is that money that we have sitting aside for these expenses on the general fund that is not going to affect other stuff? Yes, this is already budgeted. Um, they are consumable items um, for the health curriculum that will be replaced. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Trustee Robbins. Thank you, President Jackson. On item 8A1 on page five, the high school career labs, will there be any certificates or accreditations leading to employment after graduation with these, question. with this particular investment? David. Question. Yes, sir. The labs you're purchasing are for junior experiences. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a portion of that. So they'll get to experience various careers within the career, me within the medical field, which will lead to certifications their senior year. Uh, but this is an attempt to get them experience first before they go take a certification. Okay. Yes, Good. sir. Um, I have uh, another question about, about that on page 84, number 8A6. Um, the uh, law enforcement simulator, will there be any certificates or accreditations associated with that program? Yes, sir. For that one specifically, the law enforcement simulator is a private security certification that we can offer that is on the state list as well. Uh, and that, that is actually an enhancement for those programs. Uh, to have a certification, which they pass him out. Wonderful. And on page 89, item 8A7, the 9-11 training system, uh, what will they need to do to be able to get a dispatch certificate? You know? Yes, sir, it will be the national dispatch certification. Yep. Um, and that, once again, is an also an attempt to enhance that program as we have seen our enrollment uh, start growing and we need to have certifications for that program and that is one of them. Uh, with that national dispatch certification, it'll allow students to then also be uh, eligible for hire within within the state, which then they can go for their state certification. We can't offer the state certification as a high school entity unless we develop a partnership with a, a city, which is hard to do, but we are exploring it. Good, good. I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, a lot of these courses will lead to that kind of a yes, sir. accreditation or certification. And then my last question has to do with item 8A3, the pre-K expansion. You know. When we started this, our pre-K program was not at capacity. Are you you're telling us now that we're at capacity and need to expand uh, greatly? Uh, that particular item, it's campuses that we have seen an increase in enrollment mm -hmm. and those areas where we've had long waiting lists mm -hmm. that we have not been able to fill those seats. So these are classrooms through some data collection since we have expanded our um, universal pre-k that we see we need to add classrooms to and this is the furniture and the other materials will be needed to furnish those classrooms Good. okay thank you that's all my only comment is towards the um, the the work being done in Eastern Hills I, I saw the numbers I appreciate that and um, looks like we're moving in the right direction so I, I appreciate you all for the work that you're doing in that arena Any other questions or concerns? We will now recess for executive session in this board conference room. As author and six.
In accordance with the Open Meetings Law, the board opened the meeting at 5.35 p.m. in this boardroom with a quorum present, recessed and reconvened. Open session in the board conference room, adjourned regular session, convened executive session, adjourned executive session, and now reconvened open session at 8.33 p.m. in the boardroom with a quorum present. Thank you all for still being here. Uh, do I have a motion accepting the consent agenda items? Moved by Trustee Moss, seconded by Trustee Luebanos, and that excludes 8A5, which was pulled. Any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, please move to voting. And the motion passes unanimously. With no action required on items 14A, B, C, and D, we will continue to 14E. Approve the Alice Carlson Early College and Joe Kelly calendars for the 2019-2020 school year. Moved by Trustee Norman Robbins, seconded by Trustee Paz. Any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, please move to voting. And the motion passes unanimously. 14F, we'll go to Trustee Needham. I move that the new, that the name of the new Tanglewood school number 229, that the new name be Overton Park Elementary School. Moved by Trustee Needham, seconded by Trustee Robbins. Any discussion? Um, Trustee Needham. For those who were wondering about the name of the Edwards family, they, um, as a name, they told a board member that they preferred not to be named. But Overton happens to be the middle name of Cass Edwards. He's always been known as Cass O. Edwards. So, Mr. Uh, Edward's name is included in one more thing that the groundbreaking for that school is officially set now for June 6th at 10 a.m. I and leave. Um, anyway, okay. Thank you. So the motion is moved by Trustee Needham, seconded by Trustee Robbins. Any more discussion? Seeing and hearing none, please move to voting. And the motion passes unanimously. 14G, approved food service management contract contingent upon review and final approval by the Texas Department of Agriculture. Moved by Trustee Luebanos, seconded by Trustee Ramos. If I may. Yes, sir. I make a motion to accept the staff recommendation to hire Sodexo Magic to provide the nutrition services for the four ISD with the following amendments. Amend RFP 19-048 section G, employees to read. FSMC shall provide any pay for qualified management and support staff ex except at the campus level SFA shall retain operational employees in nutrition services manager one, two, and three, and nutrition services worker positions at all campuses. We shall operate at the duration of FSMC for the efficient operation of the programs. And um, the next one, FSMC shall not fill any vacant positions for nutrition service manager one, two, and three, or nutrition services worker as described in Exhibit H at any campus in such positions shall remain permanent employees of SFA. None of the campus positions on Exhibit D, Chart 4, shall at any time become employees of the FSMC. Um, I've made a parliamentary inquiry. Um, Mr. Luevanos, you made the motion, you made the original motion, so you 
can't make the original motion and make a, an amendment to your motion. So are you saying that you're you're moving this and not the original motion that was put forward? This this is your motion, or yeah. you are making an amendment? An that's, amendment to the original motion to say this. Okay, you can't make an amendment to a motion where you're the mover. So we need to have a sec. I, we need to be a substitute. Yes. Are you making a substitute motion, Trustee Luebenos? Yes, to the original. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Luebenos moves. Trustee Sutherland seconds. Any discussion? Okay. Trustee Luebenos, can you give some further clarification? I have a, could I just add? Yes, ma'am, please. Did you write that or did the attorney give that to you for the, that's what you, yeah, you, that's you my, did? Yeah, that's mine, Oh, okay, well, I got it. Thanks. Can we, can we reread that? He wrote yes. that, sure. that's his, I thought the attorney. Or do you have copies? I do. But he wrote it himself. I thought it was the attorney giving us the, the wording. Okay. So, you've got a, is it on the floor or where is it? It's, we're waiting right now. We have, it's on the floor. Trustee Luebnos has, has moved. Sutherland has seconded. We're waiting for copies. Trustee Paz has made a parliamentary inquiry. And, and I have a comment on the board as well. Sending it this way. My question was answered. That's yeah, yours very good just trying to update everybody where we are trustee Moss had asked oh, what motion is on the floor that's that's the question motion is on the floor the one we had in the book the substitute motion is on the floor we made the substitute motion okay Trustee Needham. Um, Trustee Lulagamos, wasn't your intention to amend the original motion? Yes. And But the original motion needs to be made by someone else first, is then, what I think Ms. Pop said. Right. You can't do so, both. We'll go back to someone else make the... So someone needs make the, to make the motion. And then he wants to amend it. I, I don't really understand if it's not the best. But if other people are moving forward, I will make the motion to amend. With, with the it's person? Like, it's like a courtesy second. Mm -hmm. No. I thought we'd resolved yeah. it with a no, substitute. We don't need one to amend. We need <laughs> one for the main motion. Trustee Jackson, we, we have a substitute motion on the floor. And it's and it's his motion with this sub, this language where he's... It's to approve the contract, but with these terms in it. Council, are you telling me that this is the original contract with terms for amending RFP 19048 section G employees to read and then one and two. So it's the exact contract with these two items being changed. He's, he's, he's saying he's, he's, he's voting to approve it with these terms yes. included. And what are these terms? <clears throat> Trustee Luebenos, do you want to? Basically say that uh, to all the employees to remain employees of the district. Uh, I know we have, have a compromise, but my hope is to for all the employees to remain uh, mm -hmm. employees of 4 ISD. Doesn't he need to withdraw his First. original motion? She is one on the floor. Uh, if it's on the floor. I'm going, moving to council, asking council. I. I, I think we've got a substitute motion on the floor to, to do this and, and vote it up or down and then you can Okay. Would we like to take two minutes to read this so we all understand the substitute motion. Yes, I know. Trustee Paz. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I guess 
Or, so we have a, um, the staff has brought forward a contract that has been negotiated with, and it is the, RF, the RFP, it, so the contract is from the RFP. No, negotiations have already been made. Um, are, are these things that we are allowed to, are we, are we allowed to make these amendments to this contract See, this prior to different. voting? I think maybe asking staff, is this something that would have, this would be a, basically this would be a vote sending it back to staff to renegotiate to, to see if this would be acceptable to Ab accept. Absolutely, but I'd like for us to slow down and hard break right now and everybody read these two and then if we can get a copy to the individuals that can answer the question from staff so that we know if this they is feasible. They take more time than that. I mean, this, this, is, this is a request to go back and renegotiate. This is another. Gone now. This, is another this, would be, this would be is sending this it back to staff. Hmm? Isn't this another let's, let's, let's go back under 55171 for legal advice and, and have some more legal discussion about this. This board will go back into executive for a moment for legal advice. Board's returned from legal advice. Board counsel Heather Castillo will walk us through. Okay. Okay, so um, after discussion, we're going to withdraw the substitute motion that was made by Trustee Louis correct? So he's withdrawing. We have a motion on the floor by Dr. Sutherland to move to approve <laughs> the uh, the contract as recommended by administration is that correct and and dr scribner we're, we're voting on the uh contract as recommended by administration to the board so we've got a motion and now we need a second trustee jackson so the motion is just to clarify 14g approved food service management contract contingent upon review and final approval by the texas department of agriculture that motion has been moved by trustee ann sutherland and it has been seconded by trustee luebanos trustee sutherland i'll just speak to people here because i know you're very concerned about this what we did in the back room was we clarified the financial situation in the back the money is now clear. The employees have a right to stay with this district. And so we're gonna move ahead and support it, which is what I said I would do. Thank you, Dr. Sutherland. Trustee Lue Benos. Uh, thank you, President Jackson. Thank you, President Jackson. Uh, we are uh, going to support the, the motion. I'm going to support the motion uh, of 90% um, of the employees. Uh, the all the employees that we have right now working for the cafeteria will remain, uh, like Dr. Skinner said um, early on, will remain employees of Fort Worth ISD. Para todos los empleados que trabajan en, el, en la cafetería, cuidando, dando de comer a los estudiantes, este, seguirán siendo empleados del distrito escolar. Es eh, la propuesta que, que tenemos. Hay algunas um, vacantes que tendrán la opción de, de poder ser ocupados por for the district scholar, is that um, right, uh, Dr. Scrivener? Uh, yes. Um, yes, as we explained earlier, and it remains the position of the administration that the board consider the contract as it was originally presented to the board, whereby um, individual, uh, um, uh, the individuals who currently work for Fort Worth ISD would continue to work for Fort Worth ISD, and when there are vacancies, we will um, work to fill those and offer those positions for Fort Worth ISD as well. So, para que los um, que están viendo por internet, que tengan la seguridad, de que seguirán siendo empleados del, del distrito, los, los manejadores de las cafeterías y las personas que trabajan en la cafetería. So the managers and the people working in the cafeterías will continue to be uh, forward ISD employees. Uh, the 
top level people are going to be um, outsourced uh, to the to the company or if they decide to apply to the, to the choosing company uh, so that's a magic uh, they will um, will be up to them thank you thank you I need clarification how will the position control numbers be controlled with 100 employees that will go to the new company and position 101 through 1000 how will we control for those and how will we know that those remain forth ISD employees uh, President Jackson what we'll be doing is um, there there's there's several of these vacancies that have been vacant you know for some time and then we'll be working to uh, convey those uh, positions uh, and but uh, the other positions are going to remain for, with ISD. They're not going to change. Position control, for the most part, is not going to change. You know, and the thing is, is as we go through this and as as things as we go through the transition plan, then we'll be working with uh, our, our our department to ensure that we have properly accounted for our employees. You know, that remain with us. And so we'll come back to the board with um, periodic reports. I'm very concerned about the fact that 51% of our employees are less than or equal to four years and they're right on the brink of the five years with TRS and being vested. So that, that was the reason for my, for my question. Uh, the next thing is I think we have an opportunity here. Uh, you have 900 employees that are Fort Worth ISD employees and 100 that will be with a different organizational structure perhaps. I don't know how else to define it. I think it would be a good idea if we did employee satisfaction surveys with all of our child nutritional service workers and then we did a comparative analysis of those 100 versus the 900. And if we see any deviation, we address that immediately. Okay, sure. These, these are employees that have a 4.9% absenteeism rate, 95.1% of the time they are present. If we could do that in our high schools, we'd have a big revenue stream, and I know you'd be happy, Elsie. They're the second best attendance of anybody, our food service employees. So I want to make sure that they're taken care of. And I want to make sure that you all feel like this is the best negotiation that you could give to them. Of course. Thank you. Motion on the floor is 14G, moved by Trustee Ann Sutherland, seconded by Trustee Anaya Luebanos. Any other discussion? Please move to voting. And the motion passes unanimously. 14H, approve resolution to support and protect racial equity conversations. Do I have a motion? Moved by Trustee Ramos, seconded by Trustee Paz. Trustee Ramos. I, um, making that motion, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask that that resolution be read out loud, if, if anyone has that in front of them. I know that I've seen that, and who, who would like to read that resolution out loud based on public comment right when I walked in? Trustee Moss, would you read it? Mrs. Moss, would you mind? Resolution to support and protect racial equity conversations. Whereas the Fort Worth Independent School District Board of Education's core beliefs include, one, public education requires the active participation of parents and the community to obtain and maintain excellence. And two, the Fort Worth Independent School District community acknowledges, respects, and appreciates diversity. Whereas the Fort Worth Independent School District, like many urban public school districts, is an institution that was not designed to elevate the voices of parents of color, and whereas as the leaders of this organization, today it is our responsibility as the Board of Education to address structures within this system 
that support the marginalization of any parent or student. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fort Worth Independent School District will address any attempt by anyone working within our district to silence, retaliate against, or delegitimize the experience of parents and community members who are engaged in racial equity conversations as seriously as any other form of harassment. Approved on the 23rd day of April, 2019, by the Fort Worth ISD Board of Trustees. Toby Jackson, President, and Sutherland, Second Vice President, Cinto Ramos, Jr., Norman Robbins, Ashley Paz, T.A. Sims, Sr., First Vice President, Aniel Luebanos, Lubanos, I'm still two years later, Board Secretary, Christine C. Moss, yes, the second board meeting in May. Judy Needham, thank you. So President Jackson, if I may, I, um, as we get ready to, to have discussion and a vote, I think that that resolution encompasses what Mrs. Moss has been about. And 29 years of service, and the work that she's done to advocate for marginalized communities, people of color, Mrs. Moss, it is an honor and a pleasure to hear you read that kind of a resolution of, of, of the journey that you've probably had and that I've heard you describe here in Fort Worth Independent School District. So I, I for one, want to thank you. Um, I hope that this is definitely not the last time we're in the same space together, but I have a lot of love and a lot of respect for what you've done and this group and this body will continue to move the work that you've brought forth um, unapologetically for a number of years. Thank you, Mrs. Moss. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ramos. Great words. Any other comments? Seeing and hearing none, let's move to voting. We need, a, we need the motion. I presume Trustee uh, Ramos moved. Trustee Moss seconded. Thank you for updating the screen. It went blank. And the motion passes unanimously. Any comments from board members? Trustee Moss, I got you before you pushed in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, President Jackson. I just want to say, um, on Thursday of last week, <clears throat> my uh, retirement reception was held at Christine Moss Elementary School. And it was, oh, I was just overjoyed. I, I guess I was more emotional than anything because it was such a surprise. Um, I want to thank Barbara Griffith and the Communications Department for all of the work that they uh, put into this reception. C.C. Uh, Moss Principal, uh, Sharla Staten, and her crew. They did a fantastic job. I mean, it was amazing. And I was really overwhelmed. So I just want to say thank you to all of the administrators, um, all of the years that I've worked with you. This is not my last board meeting. But Dr. Scribner and Cinto, for all of the kind words that you spoke at the reception, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that I've been around the last 29 years. Many of them have retired. But still, the ones that I'm working with now, you have been um, really helpful to me because, you know, a person cannot get, uh, you cannot accomplish anything alone. You have to have others working with you and you have to work as a team. And without the constituents and without the administrators, I would not have been able to accomplish what I've accomplished over the years. And I just wanted to say thank you. On that. And I, um, I'm okay. I'm happy about retiring. I just, <laughs> I just don't want you to get it twisted. I am ready. And on that, we're adjourned. <laughs>